by subscribing and leaving comments. Legend of Boggy Creek. I thought it was just absolutely fantastic that these people in Arkansas were having these quote unquote experiences. I had a library card and I started to investigate the quote unquote phenomenon more deeply. A lot of people have had the same experience as to how they became involved in the study, research, and investigation of this subject. Because it is just a compilation of notes, I'm going to jump around just uh, quite a bit. So stay with me. I received a letter just uh, May 27, 1997. And I was always interested to know, this goes back uh, historically, a fellow by the name of J.W. Burns wrote about the Sasquatch as a freelance writer for Liberty Magazine, McLean's, wide world and possibly other publications. This was in the early 20s. A fellow by the name of John Green was born in 1927. So as a boy, John Green, who is presently about 70, is one of the premier investigators in the world on this subject matter, grew up reading J.W. Burns, John Walter Burns. Uh, Stephen Harvey was instrumental in getting in touch with The Sun by way of a radio program that The Sun heard. J.W. Burns has since passed on. He died about 1960 or 61 thereabouts. His son wasn't exactly certain, but his son tells me that he is the last surviving member of his family. And uh, he said that when his dad, who lived up near Harrison Hot Springs, uh, wrote about the Sasquatch, he wrote about it in a very serious tone. It wasn't like a joke. Uh, the Sun says uh, right here, just to the people here, I hope this helps and I hope the symposium goes well and give my regards to everyone attending. Sincerely, Mr. Ralph Burns from Petaluma, California. There it is. So I was always interested in knowing about who is J.W. Burns. And now I know a little bit more, and I wanted to share that information with the audience. Can you hear me away from the microphone? Yes. yes. Is it adequate? No problem? Now, the business of science is, here's a bunch of paid scientists they get paid to pursue a certain thing, perhaps at the university level, or if they're privately employed by uh, a big contractor, Dell Labs, whatever. But I caught the, my dad gave me this magazine, Popular Science, which he reads, and I read some of the articles in it. And I wanted to tell you just about science and the people in it. And I said, this is fascinating, because this tells me something that I could use as an argument. The world of science has always said, well, we know all about this thing called Bigfoot when it first came to public attention about October 1958 in terms of media attention. So the scientific reaction was, we've got an answer for everything. They poo-pooed it and said it was a bunch of crap. But this is like scientists talking to scientists about a non-related subject. How many of you folks know just a little bit about chemistry? Just a little bit, about as much as I know. How about the, the atom carbon? Now, is everyone so, somewhat aware that carbon is the basis of all life on this planet? We've probably heard that. This is uh, an article written in Popular Science, August 1991. It says, the discovery of a new kind of atom, carbon atom, came as a stunning surprise to most scientists. 
stunning surprise. It goes on to say, carbon is the most intensely studied of all elements because it is the basis for most of the molecules of life, the organic molecules. Look in any chemistry textbook and you'll read that for centuries, research showed carbon came in just two basic forms. Hard, sparkling, sparkling diamonds for the rings, whose carbon atoms are arranged in little pyramids and dull, soft, slippery graphite, like a pencil, which consists of sheets of carbon atom hexagons. Then it goes on to say in the next paragraph, those chemistry textbooks are now absolute, obsolete. There's a new basic form of carbon with an almost unbelievable structure. It's 60 carbon atoms form something that looks like a hollow soccer ball. It is the only molecule of a single element to form a spherical cage. The chemists have studied carbon more than any other atom and just only into the late 1980s and 1980s they were goofing around and made an accidental discovery of a new carbon molecule. So what I'm saying is that you could be looking at something all the time for 30 years. They studied carbon forever. And then all of a sudden, boom, only recently they said, oh my god. It comes, there's another basic form, like a hollow soccer ball, if you were to put all the points together, a very recent discovery. And to the scientist, it was a stunning discovery. And now, the person who made that discovery and his team at the university, university they're like on their way to becoming multimillionaires because now it's not just so much science, it's how much money can we make with this new material. So, in terms of the business, where I hear the scientists say like, well, we've got this Bigfoot thing figured out and there is nothing to it. I can assure you folks, there is something to it. Like I said, this is a compilation of notes. So I wanted to discuss various things. Let me get back to the microphone. Here's a book here. This is a photocopy of a book. It's called Hoaxes, Dupes, Dodges, and Other Dastardly Deceptions. Gordon Stein and Marie J. McNee, they are the authors of this book. For the investigative journalist and the person who is very meticulous, you look at this thing and you dissect it, you look for content, you look for factualness. Listen to what it says. So, I go, say I'm Joe Blow, I know nothing about the, let me get away from you. I'm Joe Blow, I know nothing about the paranormal or the unknown. I go to the library, I say, hey, hoaxes, I'm gonna check this book out and check it out. Then, I read on the front page here, copyright 1995 by Gordon Stein. It says in there, the publication is a creative work, etc., etc., fully protected by the copyright. Then it says, this work has added value to the underlying factual material. Factual material. So I'm to take it that this is factual material. Page 12, under the little heading called Big Footed Woman. Guess what they're talking about? Patterson the famous Patterson-Gimlin film. Again, bear with me. I'm Joe Blow. I went to the library. I was interested in the paranormal, the unknown. I wanted to read factual material. So it says, perhaps the most famous Bigfoot report that has been called a hoax is the Roger Patterson film of a female Bigfoot. 
Patterson made the 12 second film in October 1967 near Bluff Creek in Northern California, period. Backtrack. Patterson made the 12 second film wrong. The film is about one minute long. That is not a factual point. Maybe it's minor. Let's go on. As he rode on horseback in the deep woods, more than 25 miles from the nearest road, he spotted a female Bigfoot, period. 25 miles from the nearest road. The nearest road was shouting distance right there. Not very far at all. There was a road that paralleled Bluff Creek in the immediate vicinity. <coughs> Factual point number two, discounted. As we go on, he leapt from his horse, took his movie camera out of his saddlebags, and managed to shoot 30 feet of film before the creature disappeared into the woods. Let's go back. The guy just said he leapt from his horse. Roger Patterson did not leap from his horse. Patterson said to Jack Webster, a radio interviewer, so this is the value of getting a primary source from the horse's mouth. Patterson said his horse fell and he fell with it. He didn't leap. So when you start to read this stuff and you start to look at it, you could punch it full of holes and you could start to dissect. Is this a good authorship? Is this good? Is this a good book? Then it goes on, and managed to shoot 30 feet of film. Well, if you look at the 952 frames, it adds up to 23 feet, 9 inches, and approximately 1 quarter inch. So, I'm an investigator, I'm a researcher, I research everything. So, I get to be critical in my review of material like this. Then it goes on. Let's backtrack again. He leapt from his horse, had the guy dug around, got on the phone, and asked some questions. He would have known Patterson was not on a horse. He was on a Welsh pony. Not a, mind, not a major thing, but it's like that is the difference from like driving a Volkswagen to a Mercedes Benz. That is, that is the difference between reading garbage like this and reading something that was someone spent a great deal of time and energy getting the sources to put together a very valuable piece. This is garbage. A very small paragraph, and I've already pointed out to you many, many mistakes. On the back, about the authors with no disrespect to the people from Ohio. And the guy writing this has a doctorate degree. No disrespect to the people who have doctorate degrees. Dr. Gordon Stein, who has never vacationed on Atlantis, is a noted authority on theory on, and belief. He holds a PhD in psychology from Ohio State University and is an assistant professor in psychology at the U University of Rhode Island. And his book is called Hoaxes, Dukes, Dodges, and Other Dastardly Deceptions. It's my opinion that we have been deceived by this author. In 1982, a fellow or colleague from one of the provinces sent me a copy of the Toronto Daily Star. In that newspaper article, he recounted a report of a man by the name of Donald Hepworth, who claimed he, not, he saw not just one Bigfoot, but two big feet, Sasquatches, whatever. So I thought to myself, well, I read the article, I was immediately impressed. My initial reaction was that this is a good case. I read the article, I said, wow, everything 
seems to look pretty good. Myself and Renee de Hinden, who has been researching the subject for many years, we talk all the time by telephone and by way of letter. I phoned him. I brought it to his attention. I said, did you get a copy of the Toronto Daily Star? He says, yes, I have a copy. He told me in 1982, he says, I have a gut reaction. It's a bad report. He didn't have a basis for it, but that's what he says, a gut reaction. But I felt it was a good report. So in May of 1994, at the Sasquatch Symposium in Harrison Hot Springs, Stephen Harvey flew in Donald Hepworth. It was the first time I met him, the first time Stephen Harvey met him, <coughs> Rene de Hinden, and also John Green. He brought him straight from the airport to the cafe where John Green and myself were having breakfast. So he came in and immediately started telling us about his fantastic report, which is supposed to be a good report. Let's stop right there. Let me not even tell you what he saw. He claimed the sighting, I think, in April of 1980 near a town called Weezer in Idaho while vacationing for some college classes near the Oregon and Washington border. So near where those three states come together. May of 94. So after, I left, after Hepworth gave his presentation at the, at the forum, I had my doubts about the credibility of this individual. It seems to me like everyone, they hear a good report, the guy's got some credentials, great, it's a good report. They don't dig into it, that's it, end of story. So I went home and I've got a massive library of all this Bigfoot stuff. And I didn't know what I was looking for, but I was looking for something. And then I found it. Page 79 of Ivan T. Sanderson's book, Abominable Snowmen, Legend Come to Life. In it, this is what Sanderson says about another report. Mr. Stanley Hunt of Vernon, B.C., a respected and widely known auctioneer who, when driving at night along the Trans-Canadian Highway near a place called Flood on the lower Fraser River south of Yale on May 17, 1956, had to slow down to permit one of them to cross the road, a Bigfoot. It was immense and covered with gray hair and waiting on the other side of the road there was, Mr. Hunt relates, another one, gangly, not stocky like a bear. Note the word gangly. Stanley Hunt, 1956, driving down the road in the evening time, sees not one, but two. One of them is reported to be, with quotations around it, gangly. Then we go back to Donald Hepworth. He was sitting in John Green's room, in John Green's living room, and he said, I read your masterpiece, referring to John Green's 1978 book, Sasquatch the Apes Among Us. And I scratched my head and I go, masterpiece? And I, I just, I said, huh. So it told me that the guy had done some reading. Hepworth's report in a nutshell. Hepworth said he saw two of them. He said their bodies were gangly rather than heavy or muscular. Note the word again, gangly. This is what he refers to him, to the two subjects that he saw. Donald Hepworth is not just anybody. He's the former Chief Inspector, Ont Inspector of the Ontario Humane Society. This individual comes with a lot of credentials. So therefore, one might automatically assume his level of credibility goes up. But to me, it seemed like his level of incredibility went up. 
He proceeded to tell the audience that he saw two creatures. He proceeded to tell the audience there that when he saw the subject in profile, he saw the genitalia of this male subject. To the best of my knowledge, almost nobody has ever seen the genitalia of a Sasquatch from the profile. Then he says, like Mr. Stanley Hunt in 1956, slow down to permit them to cross. Very similar. Then Donald Hepworth told, told the audience in 1994, he says, I'm very meticulous in terms of time. His sketch, he had a sketch that he gave to the Toronto Star. His sketch has a date on it, April 6, 9, April 6, 1980. He told me very specifically, he says, I'll never forget the day it happened. He said it happened April 8, 1980. In quotations, he said, I had a distinct re recollection it happened April 8, 1980. His sketch is dated April 6, 1980. He told the reporter from the Toronto Star it happened on still another day, April 7. So I said, wait a minute, maybe this guy is lying, or maybe he just doesn't have his dates, he's mixed up on his dates. But he told me he had a distinct recollection, not a vague recollection, a very distinct recollection, so I held him to it. So it either happened on the 6th, the 7th, or the 8th. I don't know. Then he proceeded to tell the people, and I think this is a major discrepancy. He says, during the course of seeing the two objects in front, he said he was the only observer. He was the only guy to see it. And his wife, sitting alongside, was sleeping. And he, he said, wake up, wake up, look at that. She never saw anything. That's what he said in May of 1994. He said specifically, my wife never saw diddly squat. Last year, I went nationwide, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, all over the bloody place, six months in my motorhome. I met with a fellow in Indiana by the name of Larry Batson, who had spoken to Mr. Hepworth shortly after his quote unquote alleged Bigfoot sighting occurred. And I said, Larry, what do you know about Mr. Hepworth? Tell me about it. And he proceeded to tell me about what Mr. Hepworth uh, allegedly saw. And then he goes on to say, Larry told me, Larry Batson told me this, he said, and his wife saw it too. And I go, hold the phone. I said, what did you say, Larry? And he says, yeah, and his wife saw it too. And I said, wait a minute, that's not what the guy told the reporter of the Toronto Star. That's not what he said at the forum in 1994. More discrepancies. We're saying that we're trying to take the individual's word, but as you, as you begin to dissect and examine his word, it starts to fall apart. Dan, are you saying then that Don Hepworth is either a very, is he, are you saying he's a very clever hoaxer or a very stupid hoaxer? I think he's a very clever hoaxer. Well then how could he make so many mistakes telling different people different things? He can't be both. Well, he's not clever. What's your answer? I, I, my answer is I think he's very clever. Well, then how can he be telling different people different versions? Well, then maybe he's dumb, but I think he was very clever. <laughs> well, you better make up your mind. Right? I interviewed him questions, twice. Questions after. Okay. Then he proceeded to tell, Larry Batson also told me that not only did he see the individuals, but he got out of his vehicle and went up the bank and watched the two subjects disappear into the woods. 
when he was asked the question in May of 1994, he said all he did was slow down his vehicle, watch the subjects cross the road, and then continue on. So this was thought to be a good report. I dug into it a little bit. I do not think it's a good report. But there are people that take Kepler's report, and many like them, worldwide, nationwide, and it's just another good report. No one ever digs into anything. My opinion. I wanted to discuss with you just briefly the Patterson-Gimlin film. One of the first reporters, not the first, but one of the early reporters from the Vancouver province talked with Roger Patterson October 24th, 1967, four days after his historic event. When I got up to Stephen Harvey's, I phoned Tony Eberts. He's now retired from the province. He told me something I had never heard before. We all have this assumption or perception that when the subject was first seen at the Patterson-Gimlin film site, the subject was supposed to be crouching by the creek. The subject got up, turned around, and proceeded to walk away from Roger and Bob Gimlin. This is what Tony Ebert says four days after the event when Roger spoke with him by telephone. So he, this is, would be considered a secondary source, if I'm not mistaken, because Roger said it and told it to the reporter. I called the reporter. He said he was very confident in what Roger said and reported accurately and actually remembers who Roger Patterson was. She said, Tony Ebert says, she stood there for maybe half a minute and then started walking away, still upright. This is Roger Patterson being quoted. Roger then goes on to say, according to Tony Ebert, she crossed the creek, got back up on a logging road up ahead and moved out of sight. So if she crossed, crossed the creek, I don't know, but I might assume that she might have got her foot wet, both feet wet. When you start to look at the Patterson-Gimlin film, one of the criticisms that has often come up, the soles of the feet are awfully light, light colored. I'm only speculating, I don't know. But if Patterson told Tony Eberts she crossed the creek, I assume that maybe it's so, because it's coming from a primary source. So if she got, like when you go to the beach, you get your foot wet, you take it out, you walk a little bit, you got sand on your feet, and even if you have a dark sole, you're going to have that sand there and it's going to be very light. So maybe during the motion picture, this is what you see is the very light co colored soles, maybe is not representative of the subject itself, but the sand that was picked up on the sandbar from crossing the creek. November 10th, 19, now let's finish with Patterson. One more. Enjoying all this rare and unique content, please show your support by subscribing and leaving comments.